Well, good afternoon. My name is Adam Olson. I'm the MLA for Saanich North and the Islands, and it is Friday, October the 5th. This is episode 26, Gary. 26 episodes of The Public Circle Live. You are following, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done an episode of The Public Circle Live. The last episode was with Richard Zussman. So you're Indeed. following uh, the, the illustrious Richard Zussman. Uh, and on that episode, we were in a car at the Swasson Ferry Terminal. Like, this is high-quality television. Like comedians going for coffee? He, <laughs> in a car. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, and he was literally answering emails um, in the middle of an episode. Not important emails either, like just no. like cleaning out the inbox. Anyways, I'm with, I'm with uh, Gary Holman, uh, the former MLA here in Saanich North in the Islands, and uh, Salt Spring Island resident and Brentwood Bay resident, and... We are here today uh, and having a conversation about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Uh, I was on Salt Spring a, a couple of weeks back, and I've always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do an episode uh, of the Public Circle Live on proportional representation. And uh, as the MLA, NDP MLA in this riding, and Gary was the um, critic for democratic reform for the BC NDP, and I know Gary has always been a strong proponent for uh, reforming our electoral system. The way I put it is fairness in our electoral system, making sure that uh, the way that the people voted on election day is reflected in the seat count after election day. Is that a good way of putting it? It's pretty simple, really. Pretty basic fairness. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so I want to just I want to just do a, a quick plug. This episode of the Public Circle Live is brought to you by uh, Girl Guide Cookies. Gary and I have been eating Girl Guide cookies um, earlier. Just one. Uh, one girl, a Girl Guide cookie. We'll see what happens after. And uh, that's brought to you by Greta. There's nothing like chocolate mint Girl Guide cookies dropped off at the constituency office. So thank you, Greta. And uh, we were very glad to, uh, to to buy four boxes. Actually, Silas and Ella will be very happy for four boxes. So nice. let's get into it. Um, a little bit here, Gary. Uh, so t talk maybe about your work and, and your past experience and past work on democratic reform. Appointed as critic by Adrian Dix, um, who stepped down a year later. It wasn't until John Horgan uh, became leader of the NDP, uh, where John almost immediately uh, committed um, the party, and if we form government, to um, put electoral reform back on the table, to have another referendum. And right. so my job was to consult with, with the public, but with advocates like Fair Vote and others, and uh, travel the province, uh, getting feedback on the devil in the details, like you know, what, what would the question, uh, what would the question be, um, and that that kind of thing. The the key recommendation I made to John which he accepted, which came from uh, advocates, but also the public, was the approval threshold of 50%. And right. as you know, we had two referenda on a particular form of um, proportional representation, and the threshold was set at 60%. It actually got 57% in 2005. Uh, actually only 38% in 2009. So that was a, a key question. Uh, John accepted that recommendation, mm -hmm. which um, gives us the best chance of British Columbia we've ever had to actually change the voting system to a fairer one where essentially, and there's various systems put forward in the referendum. Right. There's three. There's two questions. One is a yes, no. That's the only one you have to answer. That's right. The other three, if you have a preference per, for three uh, per, specific proposals that have been forward, um, and I'm not entirely clear myself which one, I'll, I'll, I will vote for one of those, but the key one is to, to vote on the first uh, question. It's a clear yes or no question. Right. So, Fifty. Let's let's be clear. Fifty-seven percent is uh, many many points more than uh, than majority governments in this province have been have needed to be elected. So that's the first point Absolutely. to make. Uh, in and in, in actual fact, uh, thirty-eight percent is much closer to the number that a popular vote that parties uh, in this province have needed to get a full one hundred percent of the power. Like. Un, basically unchecked and unaccountable. Unaccountable. And, uh, I mean, uh, and you can talk about the experience that you had 
in the legislature. I, I don't want to take up too much time talking about that experience, but it no, was, I mean, I mean, in terms not, of it was not a pretty sight. Right. And and Quebec, uh, a majority government has just been formed in Quebec with 37 percent of the vote. And so, uh, you know, one thing I did want to talk a little bit about today is the, you know, the objections to not just the sure. referendum, uh, but how it's being conducted. And one of the objections is around the 50 percent rule, which is truly ironic, given the fact that right now under first past the post, we do elect majority governments, so-called, yep. with 100% of legislative power and sometimes much less than 40% of the vote. So to criticize 50% of the as a, as a threshold is, is a bit ironic in in my view. Well, it's, I think it's sad, but anyway, I, it, it is, uh, we, we heard, we have heard in the last uh, 18 months, basically, it's 15, 16 months, but we've heard uh, unbelievably ridiculous arguments of why we shouldn't support it, uh, support uh, electoral reform, and uh, and like every every kind of argument, and and the the fact that um, a vast number of of uh, people in the in the legislature have needed that low threshold or that threshold I say that low threshold that threshold in order to get elected, and then now they're arguing that it's not good enough. It's it is it is quite ironic actually. Yes. So. Um, you, you actually, I wanted to point this out because you literally <laughs> brought your notes in yep. well, on a napkin. It's, it's important. This is an important discussion. I wanted to be prepared. And, uh, and, and, there's, <laughs> not, and there's nothing more official than writing notes on a napkin. And, and I want to say, if you have a question, we can see you here or you can see your questions. So feel free to, to drop it in the comment section below and we will maybe at the end of this answer some of the questions if there ends up being any questions. Well, one of the questions I noticed before and when you were announcing the event was the question about whether we did have a mandate. And right. it, was a, it was a reference to uh, the fact that we're advocating as being kind of Trumpian in nature, which... <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, but, but again, our first, you know, we do have a mandate, both provincially uh, in terms of the parties that were elected and, and you and I locally here, an even stronger mandate. Another criticism was, is the, the clarity of the question. And the, uh, the no folks, and I, you know, I'm not kind of sure about which organization I'm being rather general when I refer to no folks, mm -hmm. but they, they objected, they took it to the courts. Uh, right. First of all, Elections BC um, reviewed the question, yep. said it was clear, said voters would understand it, uh, and the courts have said the same thing. So right. uh, is it a clear question? Absolutely it is, uh, and that's been vindicated not just by an independent office of the legislature, but by the courts of the land. Yeah, you know, I think that it is that it is a bit uh, it it is a bit difficult for those that um, have you know organized their entire electoral program or their electoral campaign strategies around, uh, frankly, driving voter turnout down and pulling out only their base. Um, having that change is is actually a, a, a disconcerting and and a daunting thing, and I think that that's what we're seeing with. Uh, the BC Liberal Party, but uh, and and their and their and their arguments against uh, proportional representation, uh, and and uh, you know I think that uh, like take the Conservative Party in this province for an example. There is quite a strong federal Conservative presence in British Columbia, and and I think that they do bring a valuable and important uh, voice of of. Uh, a segment of our population to the table and locally, should locally as well locally here i mean this yeah. uh, for the longest time was a federal conservative uh riding here in in Saanich gulf islands um or represented by the reform and then by the conservative party and i and i think that they are a valid voice and should be heard in the bc legislature but yet they're nowhere to be found and and in fact have to be uh, um you know presumably the BC Liberals represent them, although I don't know that that's necessarily the case. So getting representation and broad voices to the table is important when it comes to uh, when it when it comes to ensuring that people are represented and that the voices are not lost. And, and I think what a uh, proportional rep will do is it will bring those voices out from the bigger tents, right. the Liberal tent, the NDP tent, tend to be bigger tent right. uh, parties that have a r range of views within them. 
and the political expression occurs within the party. Uh, with uh, proportional rep, I, I think those mainstream parties will tend to fragment maybe too strong a word, but I, I think the conservative elements in the Liberal Party, uh, the green elements in the NDP party, for example, will, will uh, tend to coalesce around separate political parties. And it's interesting, you know, the, the provincial conservative leader has just come out right. uh, with a YouTube not, I don't think, in necessarily endorsing PR, although their party would certainly benefit from it. They, they've, they've had elections where they're getting 5%, you know, well over 100,000 votes mm -hmm. and zero representation in the legislature That's happened right. in 2013. Uh, and, of course, the Green Party is even Same. more extreme example of underrepresentation. But the provincial party leader has criticized the liberals for their, let's say, misinformation. Uh, yeah, right. uh, trying to uh, uh, desperately trying to get a no vote because they understand that it, it probably will be the last time that they're going to get a hundred percent of the power in the province. They're going to have to cooperate with at least one other party, and so it's interesting. The provincial conservative leader has just come out uh, criticizing the liberals for their misinformation. Without, I'm not I'm not sure if they're necessarily endorsing it, but certainly right. have been criticizing that. Uh, well, I heard their deputy, their uh, deputy leader, on a podcast. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago now on um, the Confab Diary, which is out of, uh, which is out of Daily Hive in Vancouver, and they they were, I, I believe he was endorsing a guy by the name of Justin. He's he's from our uh, from this riding actually. Um, <coughs> he, he lives in the Lower Mainland now, but I believe he was endorsing uh, proportional representation. I mean, I think. I think ultimately democracy is about uh, representing the the diversity of voices and and giving a place for those voices to be heard uh, and I and I think that uh, in the in the past um, or what the legislature had evolved into was uh, you know two parties much like we see down in the United States a uh, coalescing of those voices into larger tents probably you know, drowning out some important voices that need to be heard. Uh, and it became, and it has become about power, frankly. And that's what we saw um, in our negotiations in the, in the last summer. Um, but it also has created some interesting dynamics as well. And one of those dynamics was the throne speech from the BC Liberals um, after the election and after uh, we had announced that we were going to sign a confidence and supply agreement with the BC NDP. The premier at the t of the time, uh, Christy Clark, and uh, and her government brought out a throne speech, which was um, a an interesting one. One that I think that you have got some comments about. <laughs> Uh, it was referred to probably by folks like Richard Zussman as the clone speech, and, right. and, and and in my view, it was the most immediate remarkable example of the power of minority governments where you actually have to cooperate with other parties to form government uh, of how that situation can enhance your appreciation for <laughs> the views of others right the 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 many of the basic not all but many of the basic elements of that speech were right out of the ndp and green platforms right. it was virtually a 180 degree turn and and it was a really um, uh, striking example of how minority type situations uh, can will force mm -hmm. um, politicians to see the merits in other parties uh, values and positions well the hardening of positions you know the, this notion that there is a, a black and a white you know uh, in in any in any of the problems that we are faced with, you know, and uh, I've noticed it, it, it's been probably the most noticeable for me on the Gulf Islands. But that there are just there's just one potential solution. It's either black or it's white. It's either yes or it's no. And and that's really what when you get two large entities in a in a in a that's what the debate becomes. And I and I think that uh, one of the things that I've recognized in the electoral situation that I was elected into was there is no other scenario for me. Cooperation, working together, unlike any legislature in 60 years, 
that is that's what I got elected into this and it's happening. That's right. And and it's not it is not easy. I mean, we we've now campaigned twice together alongside each other and we've put different ideas out. Now, I think our values and, and some are similar. Same ideas. That's right. I think our values are similar and our some of ideas are different, some of them are the same. Um, but we are now in a situation where we have to we have got for the good of the people and the good of the province find the common ground and always be seeking the common ground or we're letting the people in the province of British Columbia down and that is not a scenario that uh, has existed in the legislature and it's it as you're pointing out it's not one that you lived in <laughs> no definitely not <laughs> not my recollection was not one amendment not one amendment right. uh, and and some of them were um, you know, a little bit um, uh, unconstructive, but but at least some of them were. But not one was accepted by the Liberals in any in any of the legislation right. they put forward. So yeah, my experience much different than yours. And you know, you mentioned uh, I'm sure it it's more complicated than just yes, no, you're yeah. right, we're wrong. It, and that is a more complicated situation. And I think one of the 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 difficulties. Uh, of people's perception around proportional rep are, are those situations that are a little more complex than what they're used to. The voting right. system or is a little more, they all end up with, you know, if you get 40% of the seats, you get, uh, sorry, if you get 40% of the votes, you get 40% of the seats. The outcome is reasonably right. intuitive and simple, but the, the, vote, the voting system itself is a little more complicated and people's eyes start to glaze over. And that's a challenge that we, right. we have to get over in, in the referendum. It is a little more complicated but that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a good thing uh, because the first past the post promotes this simplistic dynamic. You're right. I'm wrong. That's right. Not not just you're right and I'm wrong. You're always wrong and I'm always right. That's right. <laughs> and you're always ignored. Yeah. Uh, or or be, or belittled or you know like and and that and we you know you just go back to Hansard and go really is that the is that the quality or lack of thereof of dialogue that is being had in that house because you're protected by basically in a majority government of not having uh, an official opposition that can actually hold you accountable and I, I don't think that that's a that's a, a very good deal for the people of BC one of the things that I said was uh, fairly uh, recently or fairly shortly after getting elected was the, the thing, the first thing I noticed was the tension between the Greens and the NDP was the thing that first benefited the people of British Columbia. Is that because there's that tension there, because we are both looking to try to find a way through some of the more difficult conversations, that is the place where the people of British Columbia are really going to benefit from a minority, a minority government situation. I call the 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 forty percent of the vote and sixty percent of the seats the Doug Ford rule, I mean yeah. Doug Ford is the prime example of why we need and, and and the and what happened in Ontario with the Conservatives is the prime example of why we need to change this is because you can get you know during I I see in your uh, on this napkin here <laughs> and, uh, point number four is extremism yeah uh, um in reality some of the most extreme policies are the ones that we're seeing right now. Coming out of uh, coming out of Ontario, where uh, forty percent less than forty or just right around forty percent of the vote gets sixty percent of the seat and a hundred percent of the power, and a premier that can essentially do whatever they want until four years from now. And two things about that, and uh, the academics refer to it as policy lurch, and it did happen in BC in two thousand and one, right. when Gordon Campbell actually did, I think probably the only time in 60 years, did get more than 50% mm -hmm. of, of the votes. But uh, almost immediately cut after was, yes, exactly, and, and cut taxes by 25% and, and the associated services that went with them. Huge policy right. lurch. Uh, but the other thing about the, um, this extremism uh, criticism is that you have to get 5% of right. the votes That's in right. British Columbia to uh, qualify as a party for that adjustment 
mechanism. And as we discussed before, with a con you know, 5% is a lot of votes. If you get 5% mm -hmm. of the votes, you deserve to be represented in the legislature. And it also ensures, unlike some countries in the world, like, for example, Israel, I think, has a much smaller uh, threshold right. and is often used as an example of right. small extreme parties, you know, the tail wagging the dog. Well, that 5% rule in British Columbia, I, I think, protects us from that. There's a good right. reason for that being there. Well, and and uh, the example that we've seen in in New Zealand, for for example, uh, where we have a, a West a traditionally Westminster system, you, uh, parliamentary system, that yeah. went to a proportional representation. The stability is there now. They don't, you know, the the opponents to proportional representation, electoral reform in BC, don't rarely point to uh, New Zealand and say, "Well, look at New Zealand," because it's a scenario that's worked very well. It's it evolved to the to the system that they have now from the from essentially the system that we have now, and they tend to point to um, you know Greece or Italy or Israel, uh, which did not come from the system that we did. So not necessarily saying that it's we're going to have the exact same experience as New Zealand. It's important to point that out, but it is also important to point out that in every one of these systems, there is still the human factor in it. And we still have to have the responsibility of the people that we represent. That is still our job. Uh, and so, uh, but I think that we're going to be uh, much more in, in along the lines of that we've seen in New Zealand. They were given the opportunity. In fact, we're, we're debating right now a bill uh, to, uh, to have a, refer a second referendum. To revisit. Yes. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Two election cycles following. We're yeah. now... That that uh, uh, the attorney general David Eby put that on the on the table this week. Right. Um, we'll be debating that uh, that bill, and so this will give British Columbians the opportunity to say, okay, we can let's vote, let's support electoral reform, and if we don't like it, let's go back, just, or we can go back like they did in New Zealand. That's right. Yeah. And and when you ask people in New Zealand what the experience was, there was overwhelming support for the new world after. Uh, and and they they did not go back to the first past the post system. So let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the other criticisms of it is uh, local representation. Yeah. Or this perceived lack of you are going to lose your local MLA. And and this is one that you know rural British Columbia I think is hearing most. You're going to lose your your MLA, and it's going to be some unknown person from a list somewhere from deep within the party central headquarters <laughs> and they're going to be representing you and they're not going to have the first clue about your community and and that's just the the first of all the three systems that are being uh, proposed um urban r rural a dual member and mixed member proportional all have yes. elements of and all have a local MLA. Some of them have more than one two. MLA. Yeah. Dual <laughs> um, member has two. Yeah. And single transferable could have uh, several. But uh, in no way does that mean you lose your local MLA. Right. It would be quite a interesting. Consider if we had two MLAs in this constituency. Let's say, for example, it was you and I. Yep. One can't imagine a more productive kind of scenario than that. <laughs> But it, how interesting would well, that and be, in, right? In 2013, be, there would have been three. But anyway. It, you, it, yeah, as Stephen Roberts. Uh, but but two MLAs or, or possibly more representing constituents. Mm -hmm. And your co the constituency would always have somebody they felt extremely comfortable with going. You know, we're you, as you know, these offices have to be nonpartisan. There's totally. very strict rules around that, and that's the way it should be. Um, my experience with Murray Cole is that liberal MLA always conducted himself in a in a nonpartisan, you know, neutral, neutral professional uh, way. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So it, that won't that won't change. You you might have more than one MLA depending on the system we we choose. The party list. I do admit I have some. You know, the, the top up provision, for example, in mixed member, you've got directly elected MLAs, and then there's a top up provision, and that top up provision could be provided from a party list, and I do have some misgivings about that. Oh, okay. On the other hand, uh, there are parties who've got very progressive policies around affirmative action, around right. trying to get minorities, uh, First Nations, uh, women involved. Right. Uh, in, so there is, you know, that, that to, to think about, but th there will be an all-party uh, uh, 
committee the legislature right. set up, which you may well be sitting on. In fact, I would imagine you might be, or certainly Sonia. I'm on every year. committee. <laughs> As certainly Sonia is critic. Yeah, uh, Sonia will will, will dis- there'll be some devils in the details that haven't been clarified in the referendum question. That yeah. might be one of them. And and but you know it'll be an on partisan all party. That's right. uh, approach to it and what's going to come out I'm I'm sure will be fair though the all party committees and you're on several at mm-hmm. least if not all um, my experience well, it was very positive much different experience than in the legislature I was in the finance committee which right. I think you might be we, I was on briefly we, we came up with every time or I was just for two years but consensus reports uh, so yep. liberals and any peers and you know the language was a little fuzzy because you couldn't necessarily agree on numbers but we actually came up with cons- uh, consensus reports yeah. um, which i think is how the legislature would work more under a pr kind of system so uh, th- those are those are uh, extremely good good points and in fact uh, i'm with you i don't well i don't like uh party list systems frankly um my recommendation and, and i would be strongly recommending that uh, those lists are made up of people who actually ran in the legisl- in, in, who actually yeah. ran, yeah. and and had people support them. And, and so and there are systems that work like that. that. So that so if if the uh, legislature was going to be topped up by greens, it would be topped up by greens who were on the ballot, who were voted for, and who were you know the highest uh, vote getters, but but didn't, you know, didn't win the seat that they were in. Like, that's went, what I... They went through the, the process. That's right. I mean... within the party and the political process. Well, and as you know, and, and, and I know, going through multiple elections, both at the local and at the provincial, there's nothing better to vet <laughs> a human being <laughs> than an electoral in front of uh, system. Of people with, that's right. With your competitors sitting beside you. Exactly. Yeah. That's Ready a, to that's pounce. A, that's a bloody good vetting system. <laughs> but it's, but it, it is, I think, the thing um, which could increase the confidence of the people of BC that you're actually getting folks that have gone through the trial, gone through the yeah. fire and come out the other end uh, with a, you know, with a chunk of votes that, that, you know, uh, mean that they now have the, the ability to sit in there. So yeah. that's, that's the uh, suggestion that I would, I would make. Now, in terms of uh, one of the things that I'd like to talk about with, uh, w- with the committees, because one of the things that the BC NDP government has done uh, very well is they've used committees a lot more. I mean, almost to the point where now, I, like you remember in the election, I talked a lot about using committees, and I think committees are a great way to build consensus and build across party lines uh, because we're sitting right across the table from each other. We, you have to come up with a, a result. You have got to come up with a result that is, in most cases, that is unanimous, or you have to find consensus which kind of forces politicians to work together. And um, I, I, my only complaint is that with three of us, <coughs> we have to be the, oh. the, to <laughs> decide, the deciding vote on every committee, oh, okay. which means that it's, I mean, there's four, four, and then this, this right. lone green sitting right. there. But um, that means the committee work is, you know, in a proportional system where there would be 15 of us, which is what, you know, 17% of the vote or, you know, just under 20% of the vote, that works fine. It yeah. means that we've got, you know, critic roles and committee roles and everyone's got work. When 17% of the vote turns into three seats in a first-past-the-post system, it means that actually the people of BC are not getting uh, as good a representation as they could. And, I, and, you know, that's one of the arguments that I think for, uh, it's not necessarily that people say, oh, well, you guys, the Greens want proportional representation because that means that's more seats for you. Well... Okay, the that's that is a but reason why the Greens want for. it, but that is who people <laughs> voted for. That's right. So, um, so I want to go. We've got uh, we're at about twenty nine minutes here. I usually like to go about half an hour. Is there anything on here? On I want to point out again. Uh, I mean to do this about every ten minutes, and I haven't done this once. So I'm sitting here, and I'm going to do it right at the end. Gary Holman. Um, Adam Olson, we're talking proportional representation. If you just joined us, I've got one comment from Heather Tuft. And we've done our, done our homework. Have we gone through? Uh, just about, I, I did want to make one point about, um, okay. particularly around the rural issue. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, 
bit tricky, but let's say, for example, you're a, a NDP candidate or a Green candidate in Peace River North, or you're a Liberal candidate in Carol James riding in you know, right. Beacon Hill. The chances of electing Green's NDP in Peace River North, pretty mild, pretty small, but, and the same with electing a Liberal in right. Carol James, just, just for example. So the voters, though, who actually do support NDP Green's uh, in the North right. and uh, support Liberals in Carol James' writing, who is their representative? Uh, who is their represent- in the legislature under the current system, their vote in terms of legislative representation, right? Because Carol and the and say the Liberal MLA, they will both still on a nonpartisan represent their local constituencies and right. and do it well. But in the legislature, you your vote truly is wasted, and so this this. Um, this, this criticism that the regions are going to be left out, who, by the way, are overrepresented now. It takes a lot fewer right. voters in Peace River <laughs> North or Stikine to elect an MLA than it does, say, in Burnaby, right, or here right. for that matter. Right. Uh, but those votes are wasted entirely, whereas under PR, all of those votes will count towards your legislative representation uh, as a party. Right. That's, those, that's fair. Uh, and um, I would say that there are an awful lot of people in this riding, but an awful lot of people in this region that vote for a party other than the BCNDP and other the, than the Greens. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's people who vote for independence. There's people who vote for the Libertarian Party, for the BC Liberal Party, the, the Conservative Party. Um, and to me, I believe that those... like. When you walk through the door of this uh, office, you are never asked who you vote for. You are never, we, we do not judge based on who you vote for. You get service because that's the job of this constituency right. office. You know that, we, people know that. Uh, but you're right, in the legislature, there is no BC Liberal voice for the capital region. And I, and like, and I actually believe that if there was one or two BC Liberals from the capital region in the legislature, representing those voters, the, those election day voters, um, that your part, the, the, the BC NDP party, the BC Green party, A, would not take this electoral situation here in the capital region for granted. Yeah. And neither would other parties in other parts of British Columbia take them for granted if there wasn't that accountability. So see, this is an accountability factor here in this region or in other regions. Yeah. This is how we can, and not only that, but if there was a, a, a green NDP scenario in Saanich North and the Islands or Saanich, Saanich and the Islands, maybe it would be because it would be slightly larger. If there was uh, uh, an NDP liberal in you know one part of the province, a green liberal in another part of the province, um, you would start to find people speaking more kindly to each other yeah. because... Those two MLAs working in that area or working alongside each other uh, are dealing with the housing issues. They're dealing with the the, the water issues, the transportation On issues. On a nonpartisan basis. And, and, and just because their constituents are coming to them saying, yeah. I, need you to, I need you to go to battle for me. Can you fix this problem, right? And, and, now, and now we're disarming ourselves from the, from the partisan battles that go on and just saying, okay, yeah, we're going to get down to it for our constituents. Um, so I just want to I just want to note uh, we, Emily Olson, that's my wife. Hello, she Emily. said hi. <laughs> Hello, Emily. Gord Elliott from uh, Sartlet First Nation. He uh, nice. jumped on here at some point. Maybe he's still with us. Maybe he's not. Um, do you know when Alicia Holman? Uh, she's. I've heard the name. She was watching. Uh, maybe she's here still. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, you can. Drop a, a little heart in here, Alicia, if you're still here. Same with you, Emily. We have had one question uh, from Heather Tufts, who we both know. Yeah. There's been a question raised about the Elections BC management of permitted funds for both sides of this question. There are official groups that have been accepted to represent the yes and no with equal funding allotments, but there is a problem emerging with how third parties can advertise. Do you think this is a problem that needs to be monitored? Monitored, and what can we expect from last-minute fear-mongering advertising from the no side? <laughs> uh, well, I'll okay. answer the last question first. I think you can expect last-minute fear-mongering from the no That's side. Right. Um, I, I'm not uh, as clear about the third party, but my yeah. understanding is 
you, there is a tendency to create more third parties that can raise what up to two hundred thousand. Right. That's right. I suspect that might be more prevalent on the no side. I don't want to be unfair, but uh, to make a generalization, you know, that the, I I do think that. Uh, big money interests are more dominant on the no side than, than right. that. yes, that may be unfair, but that's my view. And so uh, you can have no organizations, um, uh, each with access to $200,000. Right. So uh, that could create a bit of an unfair um, you know, advantage in terms of information or misinformation getting out to voters. It, it is a problem. I don't know that it can be you know, addressed at this point late stage. Well, I'm more concerned about the messages. Uh, I've suggested a fair vote, uh, for example, that they should be uh, pursuing some of the misinformation that's coming out of the no side. Like, right. you know, we've talked about a number of the things right here, right around losing your locally elected MLA. Right. Um, that's a deliberate choice of language, but incredibly deceptive. And it's that's just right. not true. And, right. I, and I don't think that kind of thing should be allowed. But I, I, I know it's difficult, must be difficult for Elections BC to try and, you know, enforce um, those kinds of rules in a campaign mm -hmm. like this. Elections BC uh, <coughs> does an incredible does an incredible job. They are they are a uh, a bang up agency of the of the uh, uh, in our in our provincial government, and um, they they execute elections very very professionally. And so I'm certain that they're I'm certain that they're they are aware of the issues that are there and 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 have as best they can have uh, are dealing with them. Um, do we think? Do I think that it should be monitored? Absolutely, I think that they probably yeah. are, and I and I actually think that that uh, you know one of the one of the ministers who has done an outstanding job has been the attorney general, and and will um, will be uh, will be taking a look at that as it as it goes forward. Um, so also Joanne Way Erickson, who's probably taken the I think I think Joanne Way she is a nutty cake photography. Oh, okay. Remember, you know, yes, you know Nutty Cake? Yeah. So Joanne, I think, has taken the photographs of every municipal candidate on the Saanich Peninsula. I think. She, she'll she give a thumbs up or thumbs down on that, but um, she's Nutty Cake photography. She jumped on and said hello and hey. gave us a wave. So Nice. She there took a lot of my photos as Emily. Really yeah. appreciated her um, coming out to events and That's right. you know, documenting who was there. Yeah. Nice. So... A plug. I don't. I, I don't normally do this, but there's <laughs> nutty. Just check out nuttycake.com. Well, but she You'll does perform up. a public service. She does. That's absolutely right. So, um, we're gonna. We're now in the wrap up stages of this. Uh, this amazing broadcast here, live from Sandwich North in the Islands. Um, any final thoughts? Any final? Um, do you have a pitch? <laughs> I th I Elevator think, pitch. I think we've been making it but re I mean you said it right at the beginning uh, I, th I think the key word is about fairness right. uh, that's that's why you have fair voting BC and fair vote Canada right. that that's what this is about fairness and every vote counting right. and yes a little more compli uh, complexity in terms of the voting system and and forming government you, you don't just government just doesn't get formed uh, one minute after the election Right. Uh, there are going to have to be a couple or maybe more than a couple parties sit down and talk about how they can or whether they can work together. Yeah, that's a little more complicated, but that's the way it should work. And voters will be better served by that. You know, I think I think the word uh, fairness, uh, which you mentioned right from the get go, is is the key one here. We've, this is the best chance we've ever had to change right. this voting system. If we do it in British Columbia, uh, I think it will be contagious. I think right. you will see other provinces start to consider, and who knows, maybe even come back uh, to the table at the, the federal level. And you can only hope that people will take with a grain of salt some of the complaints, uh, the, um, the criticisms being made by the, the no side. Really think through those criticisms. Listen to both sides, absolutely. And I'm convinced if they listen to both sides um, that... Uh, most people in British Columbia will be willing to give uh, proportional representation a, a shot. And like you say, uh, two elections down the road, if it's not working out, which I would be incredibly surprised that it wouldn't, um, the legislation 
uh, dictates that we'll be going back, just like they did in New Zealand, to, to revisit the issue. So if easy <coughs> is what you want in your democracy, if you want uh, the, the, the pathway to be easy for uh, a premier or for a government to do whatever they want for four years in a, held with, with very little accountability mechanisms, uh, then first past the post is your, is your system. Um, and that's the system that we've got, and that's the system that has created much of uh, many, many of the governments, in fact, all of the governments in the last uh, 60 years. If you're looking for a government that's, that communicates with, one, with each other, that um, has to confront uh, difficulties and differences of opinion and overcome them, uh, if you want a government that's more collaborative and um, uh, that uh, is forced to be more thoughtful about about how to address, you know, differences of opinion and and how to to overcome those differences of opinion, uh, then making sure that how you vote at the end of the day is reflected, or how you vote is elected at the end of the day. Uh, I just got a text. How you vote is represented in the legislature. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> anyway, it's, so I mean, to me, it is about fairness, and that and that's right. That's absolutely right. And it is time. It is time for us to for our democracy to mature, and to get to a point in which uh, it is actually a democracy that reflects the will of. It, it's weird to say this out loud, but I think it's important for our democracy to reflect <laughs> the will of the people. That's what they tell us. Isn't that uh, weird to and, say that? And, right? and most Western democracies in the world have some form of PR system. That's and right. certainly, I, I'm, I'm sure you've had the same experience. One of the things that, that people complain about most, I mean, they look at question period and they say, well, yeah. holy cow, can't we do better than that? Well, first past the post creates a dynamic, as you were discussing earlier. It creates that he said, she said, you're, you're always wrong, I'm always right dynamic and yeah. people have been complaining about that uh, ever since I've run provincially it's it's the one thing that turns you you turn on question period and it's the and one, you turn <laughs> off democracy yeah, you it's do like, <laughs> so people have been saying we yeah. want politicians to collaborate more to cooperate to act in a more statesmanlike manner act in the public interest well PR will promote that okay so thank you so much for taking me up on my offer this to come in and chat this is really cool it's cool that we can that we can uh, go through what we've gone through over the last six years together, and still sit here at this table and have this conversation. I really appreciate that. I think that that, I, I think the people of Saanich North and the Islands should be should look at this and, and think that that's pretty cool as well. So, um, good on us, maybe, Thanks. but good on good on the, the the quality of debate that we're both prepared and, and willing and committed to having. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. This has been episode 26 uh, of the Public Circle Live. We've been doing it for 26 weeks, although I took a couple of weeks off, so it's been longer than that. And this episode, as I said earlier, was brought to you by <laughs> the Girl Guide Cookies. Uh, they're, they are out and about in the, uh, in the uh, neighborhood. Get your, girl guide to, uh, get your Girl Guide Cookies. These are chocolate mint cookies. They're really delicious, and I bought four boxes of them. So here, I'll make sure that my my fingers. In the spirit of nonpartisanship, you're That's right. sharing your chocolate cookie. That's exactly right. So yeah. thank you, Kristen, for bringing us uh, cookies, Girl Guide cookies. We're gonna dig into Cheers. them now. So until next week, Hayekwa. <laughs>